today we're going to talk about the uh, global market outlook for February. Uh, this is a regular webinar that I do. I normally do it uh, first Wednesday after the first Friday of the month, uh, so that we can have a quick look at non-farm payroll numbers, or at least we have the non-farm payroll data out. Um, it's a very simple, simple event. Um, but before we get started, who is Ransomus and what do we do? Uh, Ransomus, uh, we are a diversified financial services provider. We uh, do online trading, which is uh, our, our platform with uh, our partners Velocity uh, and DMA. You can essentially take control of your finances and we just give you the, the easiest and most efficient, hopefully, route to market. So if you want to go and buy MTN shares, you want to go buy Amazon shares, you want to go buy concentrated orange juice futures, uh, we have a, uh, a method for you to buy that across uh, multiple exchanges internationally, but you essentially control all of the uh, decision making yourself, uh, and you generally do the execution yourself. Um, very, very low minimum entry criteria for those for that product. Um, the private broking, a little bit higher entry criteria, but yeah, we, we build a relationship with you. Uh, Dan is kind of heading it up, but we want to chat to you. Generally, the minimum investment there is $5 million. Uh, obviously, you know, with the smaller accounts, we just can't, uh, can't afford to give you guys low cost and, uh, and that kind of high touch service. Um, so we try and do everything one to many in online trading, private broking. It's very, very personal. Um, you know, you ask questions about stocks. We go and do the research for you. We come back, we present ideas to you, a much more hands-on approach. Um, and happy we've got a new analyst that uh, it's going to be quite a limited distribution list. Um, so if you are part of our private broking segment and you kind of meet the criteria, you'll be introduced to our new analyst shortly. Uh, it's a very, very small list, but very, very exciting for, for the guys that are going to get access to that. Unfortunately, we can't give access to everyone because, you know, with any research, the more people that have it, uh, the less uh, likely the, the opportunity is to stay in the market. So if we publish something, it's just the nature of markets that, uh, you know, any mispricing gaps close, but very, very well-respected analysts that's joined us. Uh, private broken clients are getting access to that research. If you are one of them, you will know about it shortly. Uh, managed portfolios, this is where we take control of the funds for you. We do all the investments. Uh, this webinar today is really is to support the managed portfolio clients. Uh, we've got uh, the assets continue to grow in this portfolio. Uh, we're in our flagship portfolio, which is the global equity portfolio. We are starting to launch the subsidiary portfolios in Europe and um, uh, UK and Australia, uh, as well as uh, you know, we were actually in the process of building a high dividend portfolio locally. We run a local portfolio um, that we put, in, we generally use it inside uh, retirement annuities and living annuities for money that, or at least more in retirement annuities for money that is. Uh, essentially trapped in South Africa for those under 55. It gives you a little bit of more of an attractive option than the traditional very high cost uh, uh, unitized funds if you do it in a stockbroking account. Uh, these are all things we do in managed portfolios, but as part of it, once a month, I come and tell you what our view is of the uh, global markets and where we think things are going, what are the big concerns around investments, and basically how we, how we think about markets. Uh, Verb heads up structured products. Structured products, obviously, a medium risk or can be medium risk, can be higher, can be even lower, uh, medium to low risk. Uh, but essentially, products that have a contingent payoff uh, normally have some sort of capital protection. He's got a new structure out um, that is uh, linked to an ESG index. He really, really likes it. We've got seven times gearing on it with 100% capital protection uh, over December. We're rerunning it now. Uh, we've also obviously got the, the standard uh, yield enhancing stuff out of Switzerland. But if you are interested in medium risk products, please do come and chat to us. I'm sure we would be very interested to hear from you and we can look at potentially structuring something for you. Offshore transfers that uh, Crystal takes care of. Obviously, 80, uh, most of our clients now work internationally. That's why this presentation is also going to have a slightly international focus. Uh, and the reason for that is just our assets happen to be overseas these days. So most South African private clients, especially with after-tax money that isn't uh, constrained by Regulation 28, uh, are moving funds out of the country. They look at the, the, the situation locally, they're concerned, um, and it's just the, the nature of things. So, so, so 85 to 90 percent of our assets are sitting outside of South Africa. And to help facilitate that and make the whole process easy, we run, we, we've registered with the Reserve Bank. We run a treasury service for our clients as well, where we can give you very low cost international transfers. We do some standalone business data, primarily it's for, for clients that are working with our products. Wealth management, Yaku, certified financial planner, he's the guy. If you're not sure what you need, uh, where you're sitting, 
concerned about estate planning or the, you know, the risk around your life, a very holistic service that he offers and uh, will give you yeah, a, a little bit of a you know, look at your income, look at your expenses and kind of recommend where you should be if you sound, sounding a bit confused about all these different products. And finally, ban a tax-free savings accounts. Um, we run a managed tax-free savings account for free uh, to stop you guys gaming the system. We do require you to have a second product, but we essentially give you everything for free there. And we just run your TFSA. That deadline is approaching. So remember, 28th of February is your last chance to make the 36,000 rand contribution. You can do it again on the 1st of March, uh, but a really a no-brainer. You should be maxing out that allowance because where else do you get a gift? Where one, your portfolio management is all done for free, but two, um, you're not going to pay any dividend withholding tax, you're not going to pay any capital gains tax, you're not going to pay any income tax. Like that is unheard of. You should be, even though it's only 36 grand, you should be using it for you, your spouse, uh, your kids if you have. It's uh, a fantastic product. And we are rated uh, the number one tax free savings provider in the country at the moment. We're also rated the number one stockbroker overall for 2021, and we won the People's Choice Award. Um, so there's the rankings. I have to always uh, just go through them quick. Uh, as you can see, a new firm, but uh, coming out top overall as, uh, as the broker of the year. We're very, very proud of it. And thank you very much uh, to you guys for, uh, for voting for us. And it's a very robust uh, survey. As I said, one tax-free savings account. We almost won Best Improved Broker, which is a technology-based uh, award. I don't think we deserve to win, but, uh, but yeah, we, I mean, we do. We have some amazing technology providers, but, uh, but coming second there, uh, and hopefully this year we, we can even move up to first. Uh, online broken advice also doing well, but uh, overall, uh, you know, kind of very well represented uh, among the big firms. So what are we going to talk about today? So that's my quick introduction. What are we going to talk about today? I'm going to try and keep it to an hour. Uh, I'm just going to run through the global indicators, what's happening. Uh, we haven't done one of these presentations since November, took a bit of time off, we actually got stuck in Switzerland uh, for a bit in December. Um, so we're now back, we're going to keep doing them once a month, uh, just to keep tabs on, on, on what's happening in markets. Start with the indicators, we're going to look at some of the big headlines that have come out recently and what's kind of dominating news flow. We'll then have a look at the equity markets, what's happening. We, we, we're kind of wrapping up US earnings season, so I'm going to have a look at the, some of the company results, specifically the results uh, of companies that are in the portfolios and just, you know, just have a look at the companies and what's going on. Uh, we've got a little bit more detail on the commodity markets uh, today. Uh, going to go through a couple of slides around the charts of just what's going on under, in underlying commodities and finally some currency markets as well. So we'll go through currency markets. Uh, also, just, you know, we can't try and respond to what you guys ask us for. And uh, you said, I normally just look at Rand dollar because majority of people are moving Rand dollar. It's the probably 80, no, not 80%, probably about 60% above flow. Um, some of it, I should actually look at AUD as well, but I've added, uh, we're gonna look at a couple of different currency pairs today and look at some of the fundamentals around it as well. And finally, I'll wrap up with uh, any moves that we're making on the uh, global managed portfolio and just review performance quickly uh, on where we stand. So that's the, the uh, layout for the, the event today. Global equity market overview, let's start. Um, what's happening? Okay, this is more the economic side of it, but um, okay, we, like I said, we've had a, a couple of new data points. So I'm just gonna start with the US economy. Um, as you can see, US economy, you know, recovering strongly from a labor point of view. So as I said, non for payroll numbers came out last Friday, very, very, very robust, well ahead of expectations, but it wasn't just a headline number that came in, it came in a lot better. Uh, they actually revised up uh, December and November as well. So the labor market in the US looking incredibly strong, recovering very, very well from the, uh, the global pandemic. Uh, as you can see, it, I mean, obviously it goes further back uh, than that where we, I, I mean, we, we did have a, quite a large shock to the system, uh, but we're getting back to what they call frictional unemployment rates. So just the natural unemployment rate that will sit in any economy. Um, unemployment there, this is starting to create obviously wage price inflation. And I'm gonna talk a lot about inflation today. Um, as you can see the annual inflation rate, now we're getting inflation numbers out uh, tomorrow from the US. Um, at the moment, uh, US inflation is sitting at 7%. If you look at CPI, 7% um, price increases in their CPI basket. That's expected to accelerate to 7.3 on Thursday. And this is clearly a problem in the system. Why is it clearly a problem? Uh, because it looks like the Fed has held back a little bit too long. If we look at the federal funds rate, now the Fed, we've had the first Fed meeting of the year, so the uh, Federal Reserve has met. 
Um, we have a far more aggressive tapering, and there's been a big shift in expectations on how monetary policy in the US is going to play out. Uh, but as you can see, for the moment, yes, they're starting to taper more aggressively, but they are still uh, pumping, pumping money into the market. And the federal funds rate is still essentially at that zero bound. We haven't seen a move up in US interest rates yet. What does that create? If you consider where the, the real interest rate, so what is a real interest rate? A real interest rate differs from a nominal interest rate in that it takes into account inflation. So if you take the real interest rate, which is uh, inflation minus, uh, minus interest rate, you can see US interest rates are deeply, deeply negative at the moment. So this is not sustainable. Either inflation has got to come down or that interest rate has got to go up. Uh, otherwise, the value of money is essentially just being eroded totally. So uh, we obviously did our 2022 outlook. Our view is that US inflation is going to run hotter for a while. And I'm going to show you a lot of charts and a lot of information today of why we think inflation is going to run a little bit hotter. What does that mean? That means that we are probably going into a fairly aggressive tightening cycle from the, 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 the US at least. And what the US does, the rest of the world does as well. We're going to see interest rates picking up across the globe. What does that mean for markets? That generally is negative for everything. So it's not just negative for equity markets. People kind of get panicky and they go, but interest rates are rising. That means my stocks are going to fall. What should I do? Should I pull money out of markets? Wrong. That is not a good decision. Why is that not a good decision? Because why are interest rates being forced to rise? Interest rates are being forced to rise because inflation is high. What happens when you have deeply negative real uh, interest rates? Your money, the value of your money is essentially being eroded. The price of goods and services every year at the moment are going up by 7%, um, but you aren't earning anything on your dollars. So your dollar deposit at 0% is essentially just being eaten away. And eventually, uh, you're not going to be able to buy. You're going to have a much lower purchasing power than you had previously. So the answer is certainly not to reduce the cash in situations like that. So that doesn't make sense. Um, lots of people say, oh, but we need to de-risk our portfolios. We want to get out of stocks, maybe go look at a different asset class. Let's go and look at something like property or bonds. The same applies there. Property and bonds both, okay, let's look at the property market. Think of it your home loan, for example, I'm just going to use a very simple retail uh, understanding. What happens when interest rates go up? Uh, the payments become more expensive. What happens then? Uh, you can't, potentially people can't afford those kind of repayments and they're forced to sell their houses. You also can't raise the same amount of capital from a bank because a bank, knowing that you have, uh, you have to pay higher, um, higher at least uh, interest payments every, every month, is going to extend less credit to you. So less people get access to, to, to finance, less houses are bought. It, it puts pressure on the, the housing market. Bonds the same. Bonds kind of work inversely to interest rates. If you have a long dated bond, a five year bond, and you want to sell it early, but you bought it when interest rates were low and then interest rates go up, uh, the nature of how you work out a coupon on the bond, the bond price must fall. So you could potentially take capital losses on bonds if you're selling longer dated bonds sooner. What is the other alternative? You can go look at more money market products with much, much shorter dated bonds. Uh, where you're going to hold to maturity and then hopefully uh, re-enter the bond market at a higher interest rate. Yes, that's an option. But again, you've got to kind of weigh these things up because now you're moving into the very, very low risk um, area of the market. And what happens there is that inflation continues to run in the background and you, you potentially don't get your return. What happens to stock markets? Now, in stock, with stocks specifically, um, stock, certain sectors of the market can still do very, very well uh, in high inflation environments, in rising interest rate environments. Generally, rising interest rate interest rates also only go up when the, the economy is strong enough to handle it as well. Um, and there's, the, you know, if you go back and look at correlations of tightening cycles, markets are actually quite independent of that, but sectors aren't. The very, very aggressively priced stocks or stocks that are pricing in a lot of future growth generally do worse. You also want to try and pick companies that don't have a lot of gearing on their balance sheet. You want to pick companies that are very cash generative um, and, and more defensive. And, and we can go through a couple of examples. But that's kind of what you want to do. You do probably want to stay in markets. Because the value of money is eroding, you, you essentially want to buy physical goods. Think about it from the point of view is if you know today something's going to be more expensive than it is tomorrow, if you're buying, a, you know, just a, you're buying a, 
a bottle of water and you know today it costs 10 rand, but tomorrow it's going to go cost 12 rand and you can store it. What do you want to do? You want to go buy the bottle of water today because tomorrow it's going to be 20% more expensive. You want to buy physical things and stocks are actually a very good representation of that. Why? Because these companies own assets. They own physical things. A mining company owns mining equipment. They own you know, property. You know, all these things that they own are physical things that, that will act as an inflation hedge. So if you want to exit stock markets, probably not. U.S. growth rates, we're seeing strong, strong rebound in growth rates, but overall, this is painting a picture of high inflation and a tight labor market and a lagging, uh, a lagging monetary policy reaction to that. All of that means higher inflation. So what's happening in South Africa? Uh, South Africa, we have, uh, okay, our inflation rate also creeping up. It's very difficult. Our inflation rate has actually been very, very subdued compared to developed market uh, counterparts. Why is that? Um, one, uh, okay, so well, okay, not why is that, but looking at it, I mean, remember we have an inflation targeting framework. We, we wanna sit between three and 6% uh, on our inflation rate. We're now right at the upper end of that, uh, of that curve, or at least of that um, uh, band. Um, now, what, okay, why, why haven't we reacted? Now, part of the, this is probably going to be a delayed reaction. Remember, we do import a whole lot of different things, but part of it has also been that uh, our currency has gotten a little bit stronger, but I'm gonna talk about that under the currency section. Um, what's been happening, we've been starting to creep up. Eventually, what will happen, we do import a lot. You know, if you look at our consumer price uh, index and you look at the, 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 the CPI basket, Many things in there, or, or many things in your personal CPI basket, probably are important. You think of uh, cell phones, you think of uh, electronic devices like that. Many of the TVs, all these, these kind of purchases, motor vehicles to a large extent as well, are going to be linked to international prices. Commodities themselves, so food prices, um, sugar prices, maize prices, which we'll look at under commodities, all of these things are going to increase inflation. Now, there, there seems to be a delay in the South African environment. Um, but it will come. We, we will breach the top end of that band at some point if US inflation doesn't moderate and, and developed market inflation doesn't moderate. What's happening in our unemployment, the exact opposite uh, of what's happening in the US, our un unemployment rate is getting steadily worse. Um, you know, there's all sorts of reasons for that. You know, our educational system, the policies uh, around small businesses, our labor, our, our incredibly strict uh, labor, labor rules, there's, there's many, many reasons that I can give you why South Africa's unemployment rate is, is very, very poor. Um, and at the moment, it doesn't seem like it's slowing down. I, mean, I was fortunate enough to do a show with some very, very smart people recently, um, where we were trying to give predictions for the year. Uh, not one of the, the panelists uh, had a view that South African unemployment was going to moderate in the near future. There just doesn't seem to be the, the action required to to, to change policy in a way that, that is actually going to reasonably create jobs if you look at international models. Um, our growth rate, very, very subdued compared to the US. Now, we have had a nice tick up thanks to the commodity price um, uh, surges that we've seen. Um, but what is the one good thing that we are seeing in this picture? Um, South African repo rate has started to lift. So we have seen the first interest rate hikes in, in our uh, from uh, the South African Reserve Bank. Remember, in, I think I was probably talking about it in October and November, we had already started to see the likes of Russia, Mexico, and other emerging markets starting to tighten. We had been a little bit slow on, on our tightening cycle. One of the reasons is that our inflation was a little bit uh, more under control, uh, but we've now started to hike. I think that's a very good thing. What that's creating, if you think of the real interest rate in South Africa, we actually have decent real yields um, in, in some of our bond products, which is, which is you know, so as long as we don't see a big currency weakening, um, it could be a place to park cash uh, shorter term. Uh, we've got a nice bond fund that we, we, we use as well. If you're interested, you can hit me up afterwards. Uh, I've actually just put uh, my, because I've got, obviously I'm under 55, so I have my RA contribution, which I was uh, tweaking the weightings. And, you know, we've got a nice bond fund that we use for the, the bond component of that, if you're interested. Now, um, so we do have nice real interest rates in South Africa currently. What could potentially be the, the, the hindrance to that? As I said, much, much, if interest rates go quickly, bond funds may be not the best, best investment, but uh, it all depends on what the inflation picture re in relation to interest rates do. Um, so far, the South African Reserve Bank, I mean, it's one of our strongest institutions, and, and I think we have 
faith that 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 probably will remain attractive for for the foreseeable future but i would expect interest rates to to start to uh, at least inflation rates to continue to increase in south africa and the south african repo rate uh, to, to continue to increase as well uh, we are looking at about a two percent you know like the inflection point you know if you look at all the analysts is about a two percent rise in South African uh, interest rates uh, this this year, like from the, the South African Reserve Bank, we've already started. Um, we probably see, yeah, two two percent to two point two five percent is kind of where the consensus ex estimate is on where interest rates are going to go. Uh, in our money market products, remember we we have a couple of different products that we we hold cash in for clients. One is the uh, uh, prime money call account. Uh, the other is the uh, money fund account. We've shifted almost everyone out of the money fund account into the prime money call account. Uh, what happens there when you get rising interest rates, a call account adjusts the interest rate one day later. So you get that 25 basis point. If Reserve Bank hikes interest rates 25 basis points, you get that immediately in a prime money call account. The rate is actually more attractive than the money fund as well, which is kind of still working through the short dated bonds. So that tends to lag in the rising interest rate cycle. Better to have it in a call account than a money fund, as long as the interest rates are, are, are in your favor, which they currently are. So that's what we're currently doing for clients on, on the money market front. Um, I think we're giving 4.8%. Uh, that could be, could, I, I might be corrected there, but uh, I think that's where, where, we, where we've pegged it at the moment on the core money funds. I have to check uh, at least on the core uh, prime money call accounts, but uh, yeah, definitely something to have a look at. So what, what's in the news over the last couple of months? It's all pretty much inflation. It's COVID and inflation has is, is been the big story. And then of course the, um, uh, the changes, uh, in, like of course the US earnings season is, is the other big news. But what do we see? US inflation soaring to 7%. We've talked about that's the first time since 1982. We are getting real inflation in, into the system. It's almost 40 years since we've seen inflation like this. The last 10 years has been very, very benign compared to what ha what's happening now. Turkey, which is just doing absolutely crazy things, uh, you know, instead of trying to tame the inflation, they've decided to cut interest rates into, into a rising inflation environment. No central banker worth his salt is going to do that. What's happened? Uh, Turkish inflation is now at 50%. It's basically going into hyperinflation. It's, it's really, really scary. The problem is that, you know, a couple of years ago, you would have said that the Turkish economy is very, very comparable to South Africa. Uh, if you look at what's happened to the lira over the last couple of months, I mean, it's been an absolute wealth destruction for anyone sitting in cash. Again, the answer isn't to move to cash when, you, when you're going into, into high inflation environments. It's, it's how you end up with uh, just absolutely useless uh, paper currencies. So you do want to have something, uh, fixed assets if you can. Uh, UK inflation jumps the highest level in 30 years. This is happening all over the, the, the planet at the moment. Why is it happening? Um, because we're recovering, because COVID just messed up supply chains. Uh, a lot of reasons, because we've kept monetary policy uh, very, very loose for a very long time. And the Fed might have just, uh, well, at least uh, central bankers might have misstepped. But inflation is coming back into the system in a big way. It's creating a lot of stock market volatility. But... Again, it comes down to um, it comes down to your individual shares that you're picking. So we normally do one in the news. So what's happening in the news? What like one big result? So the, the one big in the news story that I'm going to look at quickly because we don't hold Facebook. I'm going to look at Facebook. We actually used to hold Facebook. Uh, we sold it in September of 2018 out of the global equity portfolio. It was around the time of Cambridge Analytica. We were just concerned. One, we looked at it. We had at that stage a smaller position in Alphabet and a small position in Facebook. Um, what had happened is both of them had grown very, very well. Um, Facebook and Google, or at that stage, I think it was still Google, Google wasn't called Alphabet, um, had grown to a significant, together they were a significant portion of the portfolio. These companies both earn a lot of money from advertising revenue. It's a very concentrated uh, sectoral bet. I've said it over and over again to clients. I don't believe you should have face for I, again it depends on the size of your portfolio it depends on a lot of things that you're trying to do but personally i probably wouldn't have i'd say 85 percent of situations if you're managing your own portfolio you shouldn't have facebook and google in a portfolio you should pick your favorite one our favorite one is google uh, or alphabet um, facebook we were worried about Cambridge Analytica. We worried about the, the regulatory impacts uh, of what's happening in the EU. We have been for about, 
I can say a couple of years now, you know, we can see the social, these social media giants are being cracked down. We also, like from our point of view, if you compare something like Google to Facebook, Facebook doesn't have the techn technological prowess that Google has. Google has a lot of, it's got cloud revenue businesses. You know, look at Google in a little bit, the cloud revenue businesses, it's got all their moonshots, uh, it's got Waymo, it's got Google Maps. There's a lot behind Google other than just search and advertising. It's got YouTube, which is now making more money than Netflix, and they don't even have to create their own content. So um, we prefer Google to Facebook. Facebook for us is just a website. Um, I saw a joke on Twitter that uh, you know, as the stock plummeted to 26%, someone said, oh, isn't MySpace going to buy Facebook? And it just shows how quickly these big uh, social companies, these website-based companies that are almost exclusively relying on network effects, um, which is what Facebook is, is relying on, uh, it can, can unwind. You know, it just takes that spark and people move and the whole network moves and the thing can collapse very, very quickly. Uh, this is what we've seen. Uh, so on the day that Facebook released results, uh, the stock fell 26%. Uh, it's down, I think, 41% now from highs. Uh, what was the problem in those results? So the first thing is they measure daily active users, vows, and monthly active users, vows, uh, and obviously ARPU, average revenue per user. Now, the daily active users fell for the first time ever. Uh, it also missed expectations. They were expecting 1.9, uh, at least 1.95 billion people as daily active users. They got 1.93. Uh, it missed on monthly active users as well, expecting 2.95 billion um, and uh, only getting 2.91 billion. So yes, it did miss. It actually beat on the revenue line. So if you look at their, their revenue, their revenue was ahead of what the market was expecting. But it was the earnings miss as well that, that just, just punished them. Now, part of the earnings miss was just a huge spend on what they're calling the metaverse. So it's Facebook's big new idea that we're all going to live inside the matrix, basically. That's <laughs> what they're trying to build. Uh, and, and the problem is, I think that's adding a lot of risk to the share. And I think these results, maybe just people sat up and looked at it and went, wait, what are the concerns around Facebook? Why would you not want to own Facebook? One. Um, how many more users can they get? If they're making on average uh, $11.57 per user, how many more users can they get? If you're looking at monthly active users, they can maybe, okay, if they double their active, monthly active users, you've got just about every single person on the planet using Facebook. Even a company like AB InBev, I think AB InBev serves one in three beers internationally. These, and that's totally X growth. It's a totally X growth company. How much growth can you price into Facebook when it's already involved in so many people's lives? So one is, is, is just real growth concerns. The second is the ARPU number. The other way you can grow is you don't have to get more, more people on the platform. You just need to make more money off them. Huh? Remember, monthly active users, these are not actually Facebook's customers. These are the commodity that uh, Facebook is selling to, to marketing agencies. So the second thing is you can just charge marketing agencies more. You can try and get more marketing agencies or, or, or marketing people onto the or companies at least using their digital marketing spend with Facebook. How do you do that? Uh, well, if you don't have more people to market to, well, that's not going to work. Um, but you can maybe give them better analytics. Now, the problem around the analytics at the moment is that they are being under enormous regulatory pressure to, to, to treat data ethically. We're seeing a huge spat with the European regulator. It's been going on for a while, but it really is escalating now. Um, it came out today. I mean, I'm following this. It's just so interesting. Uh, you know, the, the German and, and uh, French, uh, uh, basically, government officials came out and said, uh, because it's essentially Facebook has threatened. They said, well, if the big, the big okay, let me take a step back. The big, the big concern is that um, they're essentially exporting data from the EU into to be processed in the US. And the EU wants everything to happen within the EU. They want the Facebook's data centers for, for EU, customer, EU uh, users to be situated in, in uh, the European Union. I would imagine they probably want access to that information as well. Facebook, just a big espionage company. And Facebook saying, well, we want to basically process all this data in the US. We want to take the data back to the US. Um, and essentially saying, well, if, if you don't allow us to take the data to the US, we're just going to close Facebook down in, uh, we're going to close Facebook down in, in Europe. And you won't have Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook anymore. 
And I mean, remember, this is kind of the attitude Facebook has taken. I mean, if you remember what happened in Australia, where they took it down for a day and a half, it was public outrage. It was, you know, and hospital sites went down. It was really a, a big issue. And I mean, there was huge lashback by the Australian public around that. Um, Google also was having a similar fight with Australia, but kind of managed to, to so solve it in a much more uh, amenable fashion, whereas Facebook tends to take this almost thuggish approach. Um, so what happened, I think it was this morning uh, that came out, French and German ministers saying, well, we don't use Facebook anywhere and our lives are infinitely better because of it. So um, again, a very, very interesting company and, and I think a lot of risk. Now, now the other risk is one, where's the growth going to come from? Two huge regulatory pressures. And finally, the metaverse. Facebook is spending a lot of money on this concept of the metaverse. And the problem around the metaverse is that Facebook has proven that it can create a great website for, for social connectivity. It was you know, like I said, those network effects are strong. If you're on WhatsApp and all your friends are on WhatsApp, you can't suddenly be on Signal or Telegram. You know, it's just how, how it works. The problem is they're now making an enormous bet on this virtual reality future. If it doesn't work out, um, you're going to see a, a significant pressure coming into the share price. And Facebook doesn't have the kind of track record that a Microsoft or a Google has in launching new products. Um, most of its growth has come through acquisitions. Instagram, WhatsApp, they bought these companies and they didn't develop them themselves as they're trying with the, the, the metaverse. So real, real issues for me in Facebook, 26% um, down. I did put in the morning note the other day, hey, maybe this is an opportunity. You know, we haven't been buying for clients. We haven't, we haven't actively recommended Facebook to clients. It's continued to fall. Uh, we kind of sat in our investment research meeting and we kind of still steering clear. At some point, it probably will be worth buying again. Uh, but we just, the, the whole thesis around Facebook is wrong for me at the moment. And just the way that they process data, I, I, don't, I don't like the business. Uh, that's why we don't own it. It seems to be playing out um, okay. Uh, anyway, so let's go to the equity market. Okay, so we're going to continue with equity markets. So that was the kind of the in the news story. Um, oh, I'm going to go way over time, so I'm going to speed this up and stop talking so much. So listen, it's been an incredibly tough start to the year. So this is, uh, I think this is for the last month. Um, you can see it's, it's January has been rough. It's been very, very rough. I'm going to show you S&P 500 chart next, uh, just compared to the, the VIX, which is the volatility index. You can see a lot of the high priced stocks. So the, the, the stocks that are pricing a lot of future growth under a lot of pressure. Tesla down 10%. Um, I remember coming out a while ago and saying, hey, guys, we prefer Disney over, over Netflix. I uh, kind of gave you my thesis around Disney versus Netflix, and Netflix was carried on rocketing. I thought, geez, I've got this one totally wrong. Um, Netflix down 25% this month. Disney also falling, but by, falling by a lot less, a lot more stable business. One of the reasons I liked it was that Parks business. Um, obviously, they've got uh, Disney Plus coming out. I, I do like Disney Plus, but it's also more reasonably priced than something like Netflix. And you're seeing the, these, these kind of streaming guys under, under pressure. But no, no real bright spots. Oil market's still a bright spot. Um, obviously, oil is heading up to, to $94 a barrel recently. It's pulling back now. We'll chat about that under like the commodity section. That's the, the one maybe... Uh, bright spot but you're seeing like so again it's kind of the value companies that you know like the Berkshire Hathaway that are, are standing uh, standing their ground but the tech stuff hurts it. Google up Amazon up we're going to chat about the results in a bit as well uh, but generally a very very red month all, all around I think this for for January it was that Facebook was down 33 percent uh, likes of United Health Lockheed Martin both part of our portfolio up seven percent up uh, ten percent now, remember that we, we don't follow a value or growth approach. We have value companies and growth companies. We're just trying to look for good, good quality companies and, and ones that we like and, and are diversified sectors to try and build out, uh, to flesh out a good portfolio. Uh, but overall, diffic difficult month in January for, for all markets, for, for, for all stocks. Um, as you can see what's happened, there's kind of the, the big sell-off that we've seen in the S&P 500. We've now seen a recovery. I've just kind of joined that. You can see there's a touch there, a touch there, a touch there. So we call it four, four touches on that trend line. In trading, we call this the kiss goodbye. <laughs> so it's a break. It's a re so, so that was the support line. It's broken support. The support has become resistance and it started to fall again. That means maybe it goes and tests again and come down. We might be going into a more, uh, more prevalent bear market. History tells me, I mean, I, I remember doing a chart where I was kind of jo joining those little trend lines up there. I don't know if you can see my mouse. 
Uh, it broke through and then the S&P 500 being the beast that it is, just broke straight back above the trend line and carried on rocketing. So uh, maybe this time it's different, but I would still say, hey, listen, S&P 500 is, is a decent place to, to invest. Uh, not to say that you should ignore somewhere like South Africa, which uh, which has some some very very nice value co companies and will do well under in rising commodity prices. But you can see uh, VIX also spiked out in January. Uh, we've had a big run up in the VIX. Things are settling down a little bit now. We've had an earnings season. Most of the companies have beaten you know, like the results have actually, other than some of the big moves in, in the tech stocks, like I said, Facebook, PayPal getting smashed. If you go look there, uh, PayPal down thirty five percent on earnings. Some of the, the more expensive stocks are really starting to unwind, but the quality doing what the quality does and, and, and the earnings actually quite robust underneath. Um, volatility is subsiding. Doesn't mean we're not gonna get another spike uh, in future, but it does look like things are settling down. From an execution point of view, one of the big complaints that we have from our clients is, Gary, hey, why are you sitting on so much cash in my portfolio? It always happens, but you know, we like to, you know, I take three to six months to implement a client generally. We've got a new instruction form if you if you are subscribing to our funds, um, where you can say, give me an instant implementation. If you just want us to push everything into the market straight away, we will. But the beauties of a personal share portfolio is I can buy the cheap stocks when they're cheap. And I, you know, if something looks expensive, I can sit on the sidelines. So I normally take three to six months to implement the portfolio. Uh, it's just the way that I do it. I'll show you how, how our cash balance uh, sort of tapered off in the original portfolio when we first implemented. That's kind of what you can expect if you invest with us. Um, and one of the reasons is we keep a little bit of powder dry. When we get a sell-off like this, we, are, we, we implement aggressively. What have we been doing over the whole of January? A lot of late nights, a lot of, a lot of stock was bought in, in the, in the sell-off. We are kind of chopping up all those portfolios that are sitting in cash. If, you, you, if you're a new investor in the portfolio, and that's why you're here today, um, you will have seen positions dropping into your account. Uh, we've been kind of buying into weakness where we can, which is what we, we try and do for clients to try and get you guys a good ex execution. Does this mean I think that stocks are going to go down big time? You know, the S&P 500 index is going to end its bull run and we're going to go into big crash? Probably not. I, I'm always of the opinion, we don't predict big crashes. They happen in panic. It's, a, it's an emotional response to what's going on in the world. Um, we can go sideways for a while. Maybe you want higher dividend stocks, but uh, are you going to predict that a big crash? The chances are you're not going to predict the big crash. And you do far more damage by jumping in and out of your, your, your allocation. So if you're going in, in equities, then into cash, then, well, I, I sold before the last sell-off and I'm trying to buy back in. And if you're trying to go in and out like that on a regular basis as a retail client saying, I think of it, even as a professional, it's very, very difficult to do that, to call an overall direction of a market right. Um, yes, individual stocks get cheap and expensive, but overall a market, there's, there's just too many factors for you to predict it. I would say be invested. If you, if you have an equity allocation, stick with it, stick invested, buy for the long term, don't create a tax nightmare for yourself. Um, you know, we drip out when stocks are very expensive to create some capital gains for you guys so that you can report them once a year, use up that 40 grand allowance. Um, when you don't have to pay capital gains, but but generally stay stay invested would be my my attitude in in this. And when you get a sell off, you you buy more. That really is the way that you make money in financial markets. Um, well, this is going to be a long presentation. Okay, so current. Uh, okay, so these are some of the stocks in our portfolio that have reported, and some stocks that have done a little bit badly. On the next slide, that I just want to run through what's going on inside the companies. Uh, Visa, Visa reported earnings, as you can see, a beat on the top and bottom line. So earnings were ahead of expectations, so was revenue. Um, they are making stacks of money on their new uh, crypto link cards, and they, they're kind of cashing in the crypto environment. So if you think that crypto is going to change the way the payment networks work, uh, Visa is all over that. I wouldn't worry about it. The stock uh, did pop on the back of it. Uh, it also looks like it's a long way ahead of MasterCard. If you compare what Visa is doing with crypto linked cards compared to MasterCard, which is doing something with the Gemini exchange and, and, and that, um, it does look like Visa is, is, is doing a lot better. I've put up the current uh, target price is uh, 270.51. That's the median target price from all the institutional analysts that cover Visa. The stock price today is 227.494. Um, that gives you a potential 18%, call 18.6% upside in US dollars from here. Remember, we're in the middle of a sell-off. 
that's saying implied that there's after results with reviews of, of target prices, given the current valuation of the current company, it should be about 20% higher according to, to most and according to the median analyst. Um, same with Amazon. So Amazon, we also got results. Amazon was a fascinating one to watch. The stock dropped 7%. percent we got a huge volatility. It's been a difficult month, like I said. Amazon dropped 7% uh, into, into, the, into the earnings call. Uh, everyone thought, oh, this is going to be another Facebook. Amazon wasn't another Facebook. Amazon massive beat on the bottom line. So Amazon making uh, five point, uh, at least $5.80 per share versus expectations of three uh, 57 per share, so well ahead of expectations in terms of earnings. Remember, there is, there is the view that Amazon doesn't often uh, report profits. They prefer uh, capital growth. Um, but, you know, we've got a new CEO now, but Andy Jassy in, involved. So it's not Jeff Bezos <laughs> who, who says your margin is my opportunity. Um, but revenue also, revenue actually missed, uh, but revenue is still strong, but revenue strong in, in the AWS, uh, AWS business, so Amazon Web Services. One of the big risks around Amazon at the moment, um, now we do hold Amazon, remember I said down 7% into it, rallied 15% on these results when everyone realized, hey, things are actually quite good at Amazon. Um, one of the risks around Amazon, I just want to bring it up, we do hold Amazon, we do like Amazon, but one of the risks around Amazon is and they're feeling it at the moment, is uh, the increasing uh, labor prices. Amazon is a massive employer in the US. And when, when if, if everyone's, if, if we get real wage price inflation, if people are demanding increases all the time, that might put pressure on, on Amazon's profitability. But at the same time, Amazon Prime, uh, they are hiking prices. So again, this comes into the story that we are going to see inflation in the system. Inflation should be prevalent for a while. Amazon is hiking the price of Prime. What does that mean? That is it going to be able to push it through? Yes, Amazon, you know, generally, you know, you know if, you, if you look at how Amazon uh, compares on its products to other, other providers, they have a lot of wiggle room. Uh, they generally don't have high margin products. Uh, and there is a feeling that they could push those margins up significantly if they wanted to, and they wouldn't lose uh, um, subscribers. Basically, it's, uh, it's pricing is very inelastic. But... Price hikes are coming to price hikes are coming to prime. So will they be able to offset the, the higher labor costs that they're going to face? It remains to be seen. It is one of the risks around the company, but good set of results. Stock popped on the back of it. If you look at the 40 or 50 analysts that, that cover it with the big banks, uh, median target price $4,106 per share. Uh, it's currently trading at $3,228 per share, potential for 27% upside, more or less. Um, worth having in a portfolio at the moment? I believe absolutely. Are there risks around Amazon? I always highlight them because no stock is, uh, you know, bulletproof, but, um, but uh, yes. Do you want a 4% allocation in Amazon? You should have it, in my opinion. As I said, we chatted, uh, already chatted briefly about Google, just looking at their results. Um, Earnings again, well ahead of expectations. And what you're seeing here, and, 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 and Google also up, up nicely on the back of their, their earnings release, what you're seeing with Google and Amazon and, and many of the reporting companies, if they beat on the bottom line, even if their revenue, okay, Google beat on top and bottom, but even if their revenue line wasn't so good, as long as they were profitable, um, you saw a stock price pop. You know, when you got um, you know, a big revenue beat, but an earnings miss, uh, you saw the stock collapsing. So, so the earnings line looked a little bit more important in these results. And again, I think that comes down to the, the argument around high inflation. If, if the company can deliver real earnings to, to shareholders, uh, people are a little bit more comfortable. As I said, Google, uh, YouTube revenue, now larger than Netflix, man, and, and they don't even have to create their own content. Wonderful business. They've also got the cloud business underneath. Um, and then obviously all the moonshots. We really like Google. If you're going to try and get uh, targeted ad spending, uh, I believe Google is a better bet than Facebook. Uh, it's, you know, when we, we run quantitative rankings against most of our selections, it consistently comes up uh, one of the top, top ranked stocks for us. Um, median target price, uh, $3,456. Uh, uh, remember, they're going to do a 20 for one share split, so that will become more affordable for smaller portfolios uh, soon. Uh, and if you haven't got Google by then, it might be a nice opportunity to top up, but it gives you a potential of about 24% upside in dollars from current market levels. Uh, so let's look at some of the dogs in the portfolio at the moment. NVIDIA, what a dog. It's actually our best performing stock uh, ever since inception in the portfolio, but it's had a 
terrible, terrible month. Now, its results are actually only going to come out on the 16th. So even though it's had a terrible month, we have no new earnings from, from November. The results in November were very, very strong. This is entirely a multiple unwind. The stock has been falling, but not on any significant news flow. The one piece of news flow that we've had is, is very, very recent. I think it came out yesterday. Um, and it, it didn't particularly knock the stock. Maybe you can argue that people knew it was going to fall apart. And everyone thought that, I mean, there was always going to be regulatory challenges uh, on, on basically supplies, uh, you know, most of the chip makers. So if NVIDIA did take over ARM, it was going to be, it was always going to be an antitrust problem, but they've now stepped back from the transaction. The transaction was very, very expensive. You did get the feeling it was one of my concerns around NVIDIA that they were buying into this. But um, they're retaining their 20 year license. It doesn't look particularly negative after, uh, you know, it doesn't look particularly negative on the stock. Um, so, why has NVIDIA fallen? NVIDIA's down almost 30% since its last results, and they were good results. Um, part of it is people like kind of trade NVIDIA like they trade the crypto market because the crypto markets have been under pressure, and NVIDIA sells. Uh, graphics processing units, GPUs that are used in crypto mining. There's kind of a link between that because crypto came under pressure. So NVIDIA came under pressure. When we originally bought, um, when we originally bought NVIDIA, it was a, it was a glut of um, uh, graphics cards on the market because crypto had collapsed at that point as well. And we said, no, man, like these graphics cards aren't just used in crypto mining. They, they're going to be used in self-driving cars or a chip shortage. This is something, and yeah, the chip shortage is, is expected to, to continue. If you listen to Intel CEO well into 2020, uh, 2023, probably halfway to 2023, maybe even after 2024, this, is, this company is still worth, worth having. Um, we have downweighted NVIDIA over, you know, a couple, you know, just probably the middle of last year, um, but uh, because it just grew too much in the portfolio, but it has had a very, very rough January, but not on anything, uh, anything tangible. Um, Nike as well, so, so sorry, just looking at NVIDIA's stock price target, still 35% predicted upside from, from the, the community currently. Uh, Nike also, Nike under a lot of pressure this month, uh, current median target price, um, current median target price is $183 uh, dollars per share, that gives you a potential from today's uh, prices, or from last night's close, I think, potential of about 26% upside on Nike. Uh, also, we're getting uh, Nike reported in December, looked like a solid set of results. Uh, it's reporting again on the 16th of March, so we'll get a little bit more in information. I think there's a, a little bit of worries about tighter conditions in China because China has followed this uh, kind of zero COVID uh, uh, policy. They've got the Beijing Olympics as well. And, uh, you know, we just get a sense that, that the, the, the supply chains are going to be very disrupted coming out of China. Um, so that might impact Nike to an extent. And it looks just like supply chain issues and, and pandemic driven volatility that, that has people concerned around Nike. But all, I've put all the reasons to own Nike, Nike remain unchanged. It is an incredibly powerful international brand. When you have a very strong brand, you can charge higher margins for the same product. If you make a pair of Nike shoes, but they're not called Nike shoes, you get, you get much less money for them. So still, I think all the, the reasons to own Nike are still there. It is an expensive stock, but it's been expensive forever. Um, yes, I still think it deserves a place in portfolios. And finally, uh, let's have a look at Starbucks. Um, Starbucks is interesting. And we're going to see what's happening to the, co the coffee prices uh, when we look at the commodity section. Uh, but basically, Starbucks also facing higher costs. So remember this inflation thesis that we've got inflation running hotter for longer. They are complaining about one sick leave from employees with COVID and the pandemic. Um, they're also saying that you know, there are some supply chain issues. Lockdowns have also impacted them. You know, you don't get, uh, you know, you, you, you can't get like a, a glut of coffees. If you didn't buy a coffee today because you're locked in your house, you don't go buy two coffees tomorrow. Um, so Starbucks has been impacted throughout the pandemic, uh, but they are also facing higher costs in their supply chain. But specifically, they're saying that um, their wage, wage prices are also rising. They, they have to pay more people to, 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 to get people to work at Starbucks, which means that they are going to have to hike, uh, hike prices. Now, interestingly, uh, Starbucks, okay, well, you might think that the price of coffee beans is a big negative for Starbucks, especially when I show you what's happening to coffee. 
just going to quickly jump ahead. You can see this uh, green line here, which is KCCC2, uh, which is I, uh, like intercontinental exchange US coffee futures, up almost 100% over the last year. So for Starbucks, um, surely that means that the input costs are rising. Actually not. Starbucks is uh, aggressively hedges its uh, underlying coffee position. Uh, middle of last year, they said they've hedged out all coffee exposure for 14 months. So that whole move up is actually an advantage to them when you compare them to other coffee companies. Um, they are making, in a rising coffee environment, they do far better than other uh, I, I, than, 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 than competitors, essentially. Now, what happens is, uh, in a falling environment, you know, where we had coffee falling, I think it was in 2015, they actually do worse because they've hedged all their coffee out and everyone else is getting coffee for cheaper. But they, because they hedge so far in the future, they are very, very insulated and they generally do better than competitors in, in a rising coffee environment. The, 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 um, the cost increases that they're seeing is actually coming from, from, from wage price inflation. Um, what does that mean? It means that price hikes are coming there as well. You are going to see the price of Starbucks coffee increasing. Um, I don't know how much more it can increase because it's so expensive already. But um, yes, uh, you are going to see it's going to be another inflationary system. Looking at the underlying business, like for like sales in the US was up, it was up 18%. Their rewards program showing strong, strong growth. Uh, which is which is kind of key to their marketing strategy, up 21%, 26.4 million people on their rewards program now. Um, internationally, they've struggled a little bit. International uh, numbers, like-for-like -like numbers, were down 3%. China also suffering again. I think it's because of the, 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 the stricter lockdowns around China and, and uh, them trying to, to prevent the, the spread of the coronavirus. China down 14%. Um, they do see only a normalization, a proper normalization out by 2024. So you're looking at two years before things get back to normal, where coffee prices come down um, and, and the, the world returns to normal. That's their estimate. Um, but as you can see, earnings did miss. Like I said, these are the dogs in the portfolio. Earnings did miss expectations. Revenue was ahead. Um, and the stock was down 5% on those numbers. As I said, earnings misses. Are creating, uh, are creating a lot of pressure. It's all about the bottom line at the moment. It's not about the top line anymore. Um, down 5%, but it did rebound uh, immediately after that. And, and we're still happy to hold Starbucks. Current median estimate is for Starbucks shares to trade at about $115 per share, currently trading about $95 a share. Uh, that's potential for about 21% upside in US dollars. That's a lot better than the 0% that you will get in the bank. Uh, but of course, you've got to deal with the volatility when stock prices move up and down. That's why you get paid more for holding stock than you do for holding something that doesn't have any downside, other than the real deflate, uh, other than the real negative interest rates. Okay, so let's look quickly at commodity markets. So I'm going to go over here. So uh, oil prices uh, rising. The, these are just the January numbers. So these are year-to-date figures. You can see oil oil really, really uh, rocketing. I mean, we're heading towards $100 a barrel on, on Brent crude oil. I'm going to look at each of these charts individually over a slightly longer time frame. Oil softs have been kind of flat for the year, flat to slightly up. Power has moderated a little bit. Um, but you can see over the last, uh, what is that? That's the last year, commodity prices have increased significantly. So this is the Reuters, or at least the Refinitiv uh, Commodity Index and the Bloomberg Commodity Index. You can see over the last year, Bloomberg Commodity Index up 30%, uh, Reuters uh, Commodity Index, which is all the key commodities, up 40%. Tell me there's no inflation in the system or inflation is going to go away quickly when you have uh, commodity prices up 40%. No chance. Inflation is here. It's here to stay. Um, yeah, it's just a longer time. I thought, let, let, when you say how much can commodity prices rise, I thought, let's go and look at a really long-term view. Let's go look all the way back to 1994 and see how commodity prices have spiked and what has happened. Uh, you can see since the pandemic, we've really seen a big run up in, in, in the commodity counters. Um, this is kind of equivalent to almost what was happening before 2008. Um, you were getting back to prices that we had in 2014 before the kind of like the, the commodity collapse. The commodities are very, very cyclical. Are they going to collapse in the near future? Very, very difficult to say. My sense of uh, the commodity markets currently, especially in the base metal markets, if you look at all the uh, certainly all the mining companies, they were paying huge special dividends. Like I said, we've just this week we've been uh, building up a local uh, high dividend portfolio for our client. 
And we've, we're looking at, uh, you know, obviously you, you have to include all the, the usual stuff. So you've got to include, um, uh, you know, the property REITs, which like were, were probably the ones that we wanted to include least, the least. We had things like Sunlum in there, which weren't quite getting to the yield that the client wanted. But the commodity companies, I mean, obviously they were paying special dividends last year. So their dividend yields are massive. So we did a forecast on where we think commodity, uh, the, the yields are going to be going out for the next three years. We think that, like, I mean, it looks like these companies are paying out all these profits. Commodity prices are higher. They're mining the same amount of production and they're just shifting these profits to shareholders. And they, it does not look like they're going to spend money sinking new shafts. They got, they've been burnt in the past and it does seem like they're, they're being a little bit more, more, more circumspect this time around. If that is the case, we could see commodity prices going significantly higher and resource stocks doing very, very well. So something to think about. Um, we're still looking at kind of the, the three uh, kind of high dividend um, uh, resource stocks that we put in that portfolio specifically because we needed, it's a 10 stock portfolio. So we wanted to do a bit of sector diversification. Um, we, yeah, we, we were looking at, I mean, dividend yields, we still think are going to be in excess of 9% on those companies for the next three years. Um, so these decent, just, and that's just dividend return. If we see commodity prices really running, you'll see capital appreciation as well. So interesting. Okay. If we go look at the, the next one. Okay. So this is the oil market, a lot happening in the oil market at the moment. We've had the, the latest OPEC meeting. They've kind of stuck to their 400,000 barrels per day output, uh, increase. Um, we've got some, uh, some optimism around uh, the talks between Iran and the US and potential lifting of the sanctions on Iran, which will bring more supply into the market. But the sense is that Saudi Arabia and, and OPEC Plus just cannot produce any more oil than they're, they're already producing. Um, Biden's obviously putting a lot of pre uh, political pressure on Saudi to, to increase supply. Uh, he doesn't want inflation. He, 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 you know, even though he's got a very green stance, he is trying to get them to pump a lot more oil. And the whole idea of moving to a green future, we said it when we recovered uh, ExxonMobil and uh, Slumberjay and some of the oil majors. The, the message from those CEOs, you know, at $30 a barrel, was it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when uh, oil prices recover, because we simply haven't been drilling wells. We haven't been, we haven't been replacing the production that we use. And the idea of an electric and nuclear and uh, green future is a wonderful one, but it's not practical. It, and, and yet we can't get funding to, 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 to bring on one new projects. There's going to be a supply squeeze. And we're kind of feeling that. And it's amazing the whiplash that we felt in the, in the, the, the energy markets, you know, specifically the oil market. If you think, you know, when was it? It was like a couple of years ago, we were trading negative on, on certain, on certain uh, Oil contracts, <laughs> yes. and we went from trading negative to almost hundred dollars a barrel. I mean, it's it's you know there we were going to reach tank tops. We we're going to reach a place where we had so much oil that we couldn't put the oil anywhere. There was no people who won't put the oil in their swimming pools. They they could not find a place to store oil. The oil tankers, well, everything was full. Um, and now we're in a position where we literally we've had a rebound in in, in the economies. Economies have opened up again. The world is thirsty for oil and we cannot supply enough of it. So uh, very, very volatile. Uh, it's been a huge windfall for the, the, the oil majors. Uh, Sassel has done very well on the back of it as well. Um, and it doesn't look like it's going to end our forecast in, our, in, in like our first presentation of the year with Viv. Uh, we think above $100 a barrel is going to happen. Uh, just a matter of time. But uh, I still maintain, I, I think, you know, while we are in the situation, you know, you get you get a rare and coming back into the situation into the market um you you know if, if prices remain too high for too long one you will see alternatives uh, being accelerated um and two you will see you'll see you you uh, you'll see the the frackers coming back and you'll see a new supply coming on stream uh, just as a response that's how financial markets work so i kind of all i still peg it between kind of 60 to 60 to 80 dollars a barrel is the sweet spot we're at $91 a barrel on Brent at the moment. Uh, so a little bit outside the top of my, my range. Hey, we could go to 150. It's a very, very difficult commodity to predict. Um, what's happening with soft? So I briefly showed you this when we were looking at Starbucks. Uh, Liffa Robusta Coffee, MAD, LRC C2. So I put all the, the codes for you this time so that you can, you know, if you're looking at the presentation afterwards, you can kind of actually go and have a look at it properly. You can see the two biggest softs that have been run are these two coffee futures here. Um, 
100% up uh, on, on intercontinental exchange coffee futures. I mean, coffee is expensive. Part of this has got to do with bad weather in Brazil specifically. Uh, it's also really disrupted iron ore production. I don't have a metals chart on, on here today, but uh, iron ore at five month highs. Uh, and part of that is just a disruption of supply in, in, in Brazil. Uh, climate change, what can you say? Uh, the rest of it, yeah, oh, J. Ru, I didn't put that in. That's actually Osaka rubber. Um, that uh, it's hardly done anything. Uh, we've had a little bit of volatility in uh, orange juice, frozen concentrated orange juice, which is this blue line, but it does seem to be moderating. Rest of the commodity prices up about, uh, soft commodities up about 10%. That's still way above um, what the official CPI numbers are. So will you get food price inflation? Yep, you're probably going to get food price inflation. What's happening in the power complex? Natural gas, um, you know, coal prices. Uh, we've also got the index contract up there, which is uh, carbon credits. Uh, we've got baseload in Germany and Austria. <clears throat> Remember, Europe was going through an energy crisis. We saw this massive peak in uh, spike in, in natural gas prices that has moderated, but still energy prices significantly higher than they were one year ago. Um, okay, let's move to currency markets. I'm on time, so I'm going to rush through this stuff now. Uh, okay, doing a little bit of technicals. I'm going to put this in a research note for you guys that are on our research services. Um, I've sent one out in January, got a hugely positive response. Everyone seemed to love it. And it was just literally technicals on currency and where we think currency is going. Big qualifier. I don't know where currency is going. <clears throat> you know, probably as well as I do. But uh, what I can do on, on currency and what we can, we can think about the situation and, where, and, and what are potential impacts and we can look at the technicals. Um, we've got... Uh, We've had this long-term downtrend on the Rand dollar. We see that trend has now reversed. It's tested, tested, tested again. And last month when I put out the note, I said it would require a break of that to get anywhere down to 14.50 again. We think uh, buying dollars between 15 and 15.30, that was the place to exit um, with a view that this might move up to this down, like kind of little uh, downtrend there, a retest. Uh, if it breaks on the upside, we're going to 16.50. <coughs> Uh, again, when we were doing our predictions for the year, I was the only person that said that I think you're going to, I think uh, the Rand dollar rate is going to finish above 16 at the end of the year. Who knows? Everyone else says not, not a chance. The median target, according to all the big banks, for the one year uh, target price is 15.70. That's up from 15.10 uh, when we did this uh, presentation last in November. Uh, the smart estimate is at 1540, which is just a, a little quantitative overlay. Current price is 1535. Mm. Now we've seen a whole shift up in the banking range. So Goldman Sachs was at, at 1280. They've moved up to 14. They are the most optimistic on the Rand dollar contracts. Um, the most negative is Danske Bank, which is at 1750. They're back in the market. They've kind of pushed out the upper end of the range as well. So the whole range has shifted up. You can see Investec was predicting 15. They back up to 1590. Julius Baer is going the other way. They think uh, a little bit stronger, maybe. Uh, 1620 uh, was their previous estimate. They've dropped that to 1530. Uh, Morgan Stanley and Standard Chartered still quite optimistic that we will get a recovery uh, in the thing. Wells Fargo pretty negative. So that's the, the, the big banks and where they think the currency is going. I always think that like, if you look at all the estimates on the bank and you look at the range, that gives you a good indication. If you're waiting for 12 Rand to the dollar, you're probably going to wait in vain. If you think we're going to spike to 20 Rand to the dollar, that's probably also a little bit unreasonable. Just knowing where the banks estimate the outside of uh, the, the, the two bands are, that helps you to get a sense of where things are expensive and where things are cheap. For me, I'm, I'm buying dollars for clients under 1530. Um, and we are probably going to be bringing, and we'll be bringing back, remember we do this every day. So we're probably bringing back dollars at about 50, you know, I'd say 15, 70 and above. We we'll start start um, uh, buying Rand again and bring it, bringing it back in, uh, unless you see a break of that, uh, that line there. As I said, I did a whole lot of other stuff for you today as well. So I've done the pound, very similar pattern, you know, gradual weakening in the pound. Uh, you're kind of trading along the bottom of that uh, trend line. If you are thinking of buying sterling at the moment uh, with your RAND, I think it's a good time. If you were up at the top of, even if you were at that kind of double top there, 21.74, I'd say that's the time to bring currency back in. Um, so I've given it a little bit of fundamental stuff on the right-hand side to full space in the slide. 
Um, one, why is the czar so strong? Because you can see the czar is strong there. You can see the czar is strong here as well. Um, one is the firmer commodity prices. Uh, we are a key commodity exporter of iron ore, platinum, gold. And I'm going to show you on the next slide just what our import and export profile looks like. That is supportive of the currency. Um, agriculture, higher commodity, soft commodity prices, we export those as well. That's also positive for our currency. And remember, in December, we had uh, a trade surplus and a budget surplus. So uh, I've just put this as all, uh, all, all thanks to the work of Annabelle Bishop at Investec, but you can see based on SARS, custom and excise, um, our biggest exports in December were gold, uh, 10 billion gold, coal, platinum, iron ore, platinum, ferro, and then vehicles and accessories. We are a commodity exporting country. High commodity prices, great for the RAND. What do we import? Uh, crude oil, coal, petroleum, electricity. Are we going to have inflation in South Africa? If oil prices remain high, yeah, we're going to be in trouble. Um, and then we import everything else, including pharmaceutical products and all the things that we use on a daily basis, <coughs> which is, uh, I don't know how many of you use iron ore on a daily basis, I suppose not down the supply chain, yes, but finished code goods we're importing, if that's what you're going to do, <coughs> if the prices are inflating overseas, they're going to inflate in South Africa as well. Uh, budget surplus for December was 41.9 billion. Uh, that actually swelled our state revenues. Uh, our biggest uh, contributor is corporate uh, corporate tax, taxing our gold mines, taxing our coal mines, taxing our platinum mines. That's where the government's getting its money these days. Personal income tax not looking so great. Can't really hike income tax in South Africa. If you guys know the Laffer curve, you know, it's basically like a little semicircle like that. Uh, on the one axis, you have uh, tax revenue on the, uh, on the, that's on the Y axis, on the X axis, you have tax rate. The higher you make the tax rate, uh, eventually you get to a point where you start, you start actually getting less tax revenue. I kind of feel that we're already uh, beyond the peak of the Laffer curve. And if we actually reduced our, our tax rate, we'd probably get more tax revenue. Uh, but I don't think that's going to ever go down in the SA budget. But that is one of the big uh, things that are coming out. SA budget on the 23rd of February. Uh, we're not expecting it to change credit ratings, uh, probably go to, you know, like all this uh, additional cash that they've been generating from high commodity prices just going to be spent. Um, what are the risks to the, the, the currency outlook? Sorry. No. So what are the risks to the currency outlook? <coughs> uh, Sona, SA budget. Sona, we've got uh, State of the Nation this week, also tomorrow. Uh, we've got the South African budget coming up on the 23rd. We're also seeing this, uh, the pandemic recovery is slowing internationally as well. So if we do see a pressure on commodity prices, that could be a, a weakening, uh, that could see a weakening currency, but it's very difficult to tell where commodity prices are going. The trend is obviously up at the moment, uh, but if you've got a slightly more negative current commodity view, the RAND could, could uh, strengthen, uh, at least could weaken. If, if, um, if commodities do sort of moderate a little bit, you might see the RAND drifting, uh, drifting a little bit more negative. Uh, and then I just said any global aftershock. So remember, we are uh, we are risk loving cur uh, currency. If we see anything go wrong, uh, you know, you can bet on anything going wrong, um, you'll see the, the RAND weakening as well. And this is just uh, RAND to this is Frank. Uh, you can see again, very, very similar picture to the to the rest of the, the developed market currencies. Uh, right down at the bottom of the range, would I be buying Franks here? Would I be buying RAND? I'd probably be buying uh, francs with my RAND here while the RAND is nice and strong with a view that the first uh, resistance level will be there and then probably top of the channel eventually. Uh, what's happening on the euro? Uh, euro a little bit, so euro a, a little bit different to the rest, also a, a gradual weakening trend after the big strengthening trend. Um, I probably would be waiting for maybe 30, 40 cents lower if you're looking to exit in Euro. Uh, a break of that, testing the top of the channel, then you're buying, uh, buying RAND and bringing it back. Um, and just to remind you why people, why 80% of our client book is international, it's not because we are particularly negative, but I think realists, Moody's, macroeconomic conditions will remain difficult in South Africa with sluggish economic growth, rising government debt, and limited progress in economic reforms due to social and political obstacles. South Africa, we are a frontier destination. Where do you want to invest? Yes, you want to invest your speculative money here. Yes, you probably want to have a business here because, hey, it's uh, no one else is doing it and it's not that competitive. So it's easy to be very good in South Africa. But do you want to place your nest egg in South Africa? If everything hits the fan, where do you want your cash? Personally, I would rather have my cash overseas. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. And that's why we have a lot of private clients that invest internationally. 
let's go and look at global equity performance. Like I said, difficult, difficult month. We haven't spoken since last year, so we've got the year end figures. If you look at our portfolio, we launched the portfolio in June, okay, on this system in June 2016. Uh, made 2% in dollars for the first year. It wasn't a particularly good start to the portfolio, and I'll show you what happened. It wasn't a particularly good start to the markets at that stage. Um, we made 21.8% in dollars the year after that. We had a big sell-off. It was that sell-off there into the end of uh, 2018. Uh, we made negative 3% for 2018. Markets were actually down about 8%. We then made 29% because obviously we kicked all that back up as the market recovered immediately afterwards. 18.3% um, the year after that. 2021, we finished just shy of the 20% mark in dollars. Uh, and we started the year really negatively down 6.6%. .6%. Welcome to volatility. Not particularly worried about it. As you can see, February last year, we had a 6.3% drawdown. It's the nature of markets. It's, uh, it's, it's what you do. It's been a rough market for everyone. Like I said, we're not value or growth orientated in this specific portfolio. Um, NASDAQ is down 10.5% year to date. Uh, South Africa is actually up 3.65% today. So South Africa doing pretty well for 20. Uh, 2022. Uh, again, commodity prices are probably the reason. S&P 500 down about 6%. We, we're just behind it. Our, our benchmark is actually MSCI World. Uh, we have outperformed slightly over the long term. We've had four years of outperformance, and last year we missed it by 1%. So we, we can't, can't win all the time, but uh, still very, very happy with the portfolio. It's still where my cash is. Are we going to be desperately selling stock at this time? No, we're buying stock at the moment. Now, we are riding and we have been riding heavier in cash for a little bit, but that's, like I said, is the typical implementation profile over three months. We'll slowly buy into shares over time as we see value in shares uh, in, in the different counters and positions, depending on the volatility in the market. We use that to try and get you a great entry price. Uh, that's what you've done over time. Uh, like, I don't think I've got you out here today. No, so, so basically, if you'd given us your money in 2016, we would have doubled your money in dollars over the period. So that's kind of our performance. Uh, I've just given done monthly losers and monthly gain and, and, and gainers since inception, just to give you a sense of the volatility that we're feeling. NVIDIA was our biggest loser in the last month. Uh, on this specific portfolio, we lost $2,000 on it. Um, which is the model portfolio. We put $100,000 into start, uh, start. So we lost basically 1.9% just on NVIDIA uh, because it's a bigger position. But remember, NVIDIA has also been responsible for, for 17, like it's basically responsible for 17,000 uh, gains. So it is our biggest gain ever in the portfolio. So a little bit of volatility at the end, really not worried about it. Starbucks, that's why we covered Starbucks and Nike as well. Um, also the big losers for last month. Uh, but also decent, decent returns from them over the longer term and trying to run things on an equity portfolio month to month is just crazy. It's not what you want to do. You're just going to generate yourself costs and lots of capital gains. Uh, we've got tax year end coming up. I'm not going to sell anything into capital uh, into, into tax year end if you're busy getting your, your tax affairs sorted. Um, our big gain is Visa, which we talked about doing well in crypto. Alibaba, which was a big, a big loser last year. Alibaba was, is a diversifying position in the portfolio. I still maintain, if you watched our presentation in January, I think China is the place to go. I think investing in an ETF like FXI, um, which is the China large cap uh, ETF, I think you're going to do well. I think Alibaba deserves a, a position in, in any portfolio because I think longer term, it's very easy for China to recover as well. And you should have a little bit of a diversifying factor so that you're not overly concentrated in the US. You could also just buy one of the, the other baskets that, we, uh, that we're busy uh, building as well. Uh, Lockheed Martin, very, very defensive company, excuse the pun. Uh, it's a defense contractor. So yeah, also also doing pretty well last month. That was uh, kind of our, our defensive stocks that held things together. Um, overall, uh, as you can see, the beginning of the portfolio when we started, we had a very, very flat performance, very linked to the benchmark. Uh, we've outperformed our benchmark over time, which a benchmark is the MSCI world. Uh, that's just our relative outperformance. Like I said, last couple of months have been pretty tough on the portfolio. Uh, you can kind of see we do, we are quite correlated to the benchmark as well. <coughs> In big sell-offs, because we have cash and we can buy into the portfolio, uh, we generally do a little bit better. But the last three months, we've, we've done a little bit of underperformance. I think it's because I'm sitting a little bit heavier in cash. Uh, also, we do have some tech positions, which, uh, which have hurt. Um, and also, these are positions that have grown large, and I didn't want to sell them. So, um, because also, it's my money in the portfolio as well as your guys' money. So, I do what I think is best. 
Um, and I still do believe longer term it's going to outperform. What is the investment philosophy? I've kind of given it to you. It's to go and buy big blue chip multinational companies, you know, companies whose revenue lines are almost equivalent to the South African tax revenue line. Um, you know, is there a risk that Pfizer or Amazon or Google go bankrupt? Uh, maybe, you know, but corporate governance in the US is so much better. They're probably not going to be sign offs. And even if they are, you know what, I'm risking, say, four, four to five percent in a big position. Most of our positions are two to three uh, percent in, in a single position. Uh, it's not going to be catastrophic to your overall uh, wealth building. And longer term, how do we do? 20% a year in dollars, we put up with volatility when volatility comes. That's why you get paid more. So um, if you don't want volatility, you go into, into money market or you go into bond products and you get 7% or you know, in RAND, uh, 8%, 9% in RAND, uh, or, you get, um, or you get more percent on dollars. So that's kind of your options. And, it, and it's one of the reasons that I think stocks are still the place to be because they call it TINA. There is nothing... No, there is no alternative at the moment. There just isn't. Until interest rates are high and bond products are looking attractive, stocks will still be the place that I invest my cash. Uh, it is always, it's a stock portfolio. It's always going to be considered high risk. Um, we normally charge 1% on, uh, on our managed portfolios. If you have a very large portfolio, come and, come and chat to me. We can probably do a, a little bit of a discount on that, but that's kind of standard. It's much cheaper than, than many, many of the actively managed funds out there. And you get, I think, a lot of uh, different, a, a lot of uh, ability to tweak your own asset allocation from a tax point of view. And, uh, and, and you can be a lot more specific. It's also a lot more transparent because you can see exactly what's going on. Like I said, I currently would be taking out your RAND dollar. We normally, uh, these portfolios are built in dollars. 1510, I think, is uh, 1510 to 1530 is kind of where, like, where the range is where I think you should be topping up. Uh, but like I said, nice little sell off overseas at the moment. Um, I would be buying aggressively into it. That's what we're doing with uh, clients that have given us cash. Um, I think longer term, you're going to, you know, over five years, you'll be very, very happy with the returns. Uh, how do you get started? Very, very simple complete an online application or just contact us. We'll send you the link. You do your mandate online, you send us your FICA documents, um, and you fund your gut, and away you go. And then you have a portfolio with us. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, it wasn't too bad to go over. So I'll, I'll go. go. I don't really have too many times for questions because I've got a thing, but let's, let's have a look at the questions quickly. Um, okay, uh, what's your view on AMD? Uh, and what is your view on preference shares? Okay, so... AMD, AMD is very similar to NVIDIA. So we, we've been wanting to buy AMD for a long time. It's just been way too expensive. Um, and we've had NVIDIA and we've kind of looked at it. So we, we, we're having a look at AMD again now. So AMD obviously with the Horizon chips, uh, you know, were significant, looked significantly better than Intel for a while. And it looked like it was going to outperform Intel significantly just because they had a better product. Uh, it does look like that that is starting to shift again. The price performance of AMD has been much better than Intel, but uh, we, we're kind of reevaluating that position. We never bought into it because it was too expensive. It has collapsed. It might be worth buying, and we have put it in some client portfolios as a diversifying factor from, from NVIDIA. If a client has a very big NVIDIA position, we've been kind of trimming and then switching to just spread NVIDIA into NVIDIA and AMD in case there's uh, you know, a stock-specific issue. We've got a little bit more diversification. Uh, but honestly, I think Intel might be our preferred at the moment. I don't have a full view on it yet because it's still something that's going through our research committee. But I would, uh, I, I, you know, AMD has been our preferred for probably two years, but uh, I think Intel is going to do better longer term. But again, I, I haven't, we haven't finished the research on that. So don't, don't hold me to it, please. Uh, pref shares, pref shares, they're, they're hybrid instruments. You know, like, I mean, you know, pref shares, it depends on the pref share. Um, for those who don't understand what PREF shares are, PREF shares are it's a, it's a hybrid bond uh, equity instrument. So whereas a, an equity gives you a dividend. So, you know, basically if a company makes a profit and they don't want to spend it on growing and creating a capital gain, they issue, like they'll issue a dividend and you get paid. Uh, a bond, they pay a coupon. Uh, a PREF share pays like halfway in between. So 
uh, in the credit risk. So if a company goes bankrupt, the first people to lose all their money are shareholders. The last people, to, not last people to lose their money, but basically in, in the structure of things, a debt owner is the uh, is is high up the pecking order when when a company liquidates. A pref share then sits like halfway between. So a pref share, if a dividend is cancelled, you have to first cancel the company's dividend before you can cancel a pref share dividend. Um, and only once you cancel the pref share dividend and that, they can you not pay a coupon. So it's um, it just it, it's it's just a different risk instrument uh, on a company and. It depends. It depends on on what they look, what what you're looking at as well. Um, it depends, as you know, like I said, on the strategy. It's it's kind of we consider it a, a, a different asset class almost. Um, but yeah, there's some good pref shares. There's some bad pref shares. You're not going to get kind of a capital appreciation you would on stocks, um, but you obviously get much much higher yields on them. And it, it depends what you're after, I suppose, is is the, is the answer that I would give. Um, Gary, what the, what does potash do? Uh, why is BSP getting into it? Uh, potash is something that I will ask Viv to do a, a segment tomorrow on potash for you. Uh, not on tomorrow, at least on Friday, and then watch this video on potash. Viv is the biggest, like we joke about, me and Chris don't like tease Viv about how much he loves potash. So it's basically all part of the nitrogen cycle. And it's without potash, you know, and, and the idea to create fertilizer, we could not feed the planet. It's literally one of the most crucial components to, to being able to feed the planet. Um, but Verve is fascinated by the whole nitrogen cycle and he, he will get, I'll get him to take you through. I will ask him that question on Friday. We'll do a little video on that. Um, I've taken a beating on Palantir short term, um, have a long term conviction on it, and Snowflake and Sastock. What's your opinion, please? Yeah, so, so Palantir, like this is also another one that would be great for them because they've kind of built our little tech team portfolio. And he, he, he likes the story behind Palantir as well. Um, but obviously, like the, the, the issue around all of these has been that uh, they've been very, very aggressively priced. Remember, we kind of were looking at some of these just going like, I mean, you know, it's the idea of buying, I've never bought Tesla and, and, and clients that bought Tesla, you know, made a lot of money. Uh, we were selling Tesla for clients the other day because they, they finally said that they were wanted to get out. But um, you know, some of these stocks, they, they just, they, they, what you're paying for them versus what they actually do underneath and, and what the, the kind of earnings, like I said, it's all about earnings at the moment. It's not about revenue. Um, so some of the more aggressively priced tech stocks are, are suffering. They are really getting hammered. And it's the likes of, you know, what we saw a couple of months ago with the with Zoom and DocuSign and all of those kind of companies. Uh, if you don't have earnings today, it's it's the market is being very very critical of of share prices. It's very very nervy in a high inflation environment. People want real tangible assets that are producing real cash flows. So so that's kind of why the the kind of new more speculative stocks are, are just getting hit. I think the, the market is just shifting towards a more value based approach. Like I said, we don't take value or growth based approach in this portfolio. It's like we've got value stocks and we own General Motors, but we also own um, Salesforce, you know, so we don't kind of try and like pigeonhole us, ourselves as a specific uh, type of manager. I just buy stocks that that I think are really good. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll get uh, again. I'll ask ask Viv on, on on Palantir as well. He can do again on on the Friday uh, edition. We can do a little bit. I have Google Alphabet A in my portfolio. What is the difference between Google Alphabet C and Alphabet A? Thanks for the excellent presentation. Okay, so Google Alphabet A, Google Alphabet C. Okay, so it's, it's just, it's different share issues. So one has voting rights and one doesn't have voting rights. One's also uh, much more expensive than the other one because one is designed for uh, the public to invest in that aren't actually going to go and vote their, their, their stock. Uh, they just want to capture the returns uh, of being an investor in Google. So it's a little bit more attractive. So it's just a, a different type of issue. Um, cool. Uh, thanks, guys. I'm going to call it for now. Uh, well, but yeah, so I'm going to have to call it because I've actually got, I can see people messaging me for my next meeting. But uh, thank you so much for, for uh, coming. Thank you for the support as always. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We'll do the next one next month. Um, I maybe can try and get to some of these questions next month as well. I'll just try and cover it in the presentation. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions, please pop me a line. If you want to invest with us, pop us a line. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you for listening. Cheers.